I've been with the Lord on this one all week, and uh, I, I dug this one out for you. You know, I think sometimes, every, every once in a while, somebody will come up to me, and, and, and they'll say something like, oh, yeah, like, how does it work when God gives you a download? And I'm like, yeah, I guess sometimes God gives me something like, but most of the time, instead of a download, it's more like I'm digging it out, and I'm working, and, and I'm kind of pouring over it, and, uh, but as you do... As you seek the Lord, come on, we have a God that's faithful to speak as we seek. Amen. And I believe, I believe, some of y'all that have been with me for a few years, I believe this is the only sermon I've ever preached um, taken straight out of the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. I've referenced passages, of course, but I don't know that I've ever actually preached out of Leviticus. So go with me to the 26th chapter uh, if, if you're not catching up that I've mentioned Leviticus, yes, we are going to be in Leviticus, the 26th chapter, and I'm going to read 13 verses, and then we'll preach. All right, you doing okay? You all right? You got faith to meet with God today? Amen? Amen, amen. Now, the chapter heading in the NIV translation of uh, chapter 26 is the reward for obedience. And just as you're turning there in your Bibles, just to, just to fill a little time as you're getting there, um, let me just say this. Don't make any mistake. We have a God that gives rewards. God gives rewards. And you might be like, well, that's Old Testament. Good point. But here's New Testament, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Anyone that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, be careful to make the distinction. God does not reward those that are perfect, but God definitely rewards those that are in pursuit. Those that would seek the ways of the Lord, that would seek the heart of the Lord, seek the instruction and the counsel and the might of the Lord. Our God is a rewarder of those that seek the Lord. All right, and God says in your Bibles, do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves. And do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. It's almost as if God was saying, if you needed a reason to do what I'm telling you to do, here's the reason. I am the Lord your God. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Modern translation of that verse Show up to church. Have reverence for God's house. It's not just coming in 17 minutes late with your latte. It's I'm leaned in. I came hungry to meet with God. I love God's house. Verse 3. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season. And the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until planting, and you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. Somebody should be getting excited already. I'm just, I'm just reading these verses. God goes on. I will grant peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid. I will remove wild beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country, you will pursue your enemies and they will fall by the sword before you, which is to say the enemy that's been chasing you, it's going to shift. And now you're going to be chasing the enemy and five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase 10,000. Ah, I love God's math because God's math never makes sense. It's always by the Spirit. It doesn't need to make sense. It's by the Spirit. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand. I don't know if you know this about me. Maybe I've preached it to you, or maybe I haven't, but God gave me a vision for a harvest of ten thousand through the cause church, and so I like that verse where it says, if you get even just a hundred of you, and I see more than a hundred already right here at the cost today if you can get a hundred you can go after ten thousand I wonder is anybody with me today after all this is not until a few here this is until everyone hears I say a hundred goes after ten thousand because God's math is always miracle math okay now 
I'm just going to read my scripture, and then I'm going to preach. No more of that. No more of that. No more of that. It's just so, it's all so good, though, isn't it? I have, I, when I get up, I'm like, I have to tell myself, pace yourself, preacher. They, ha- they haven't been in this all week like you. All right, all right, all right, all right. Verse 9. I will look on you with favor. How many know that in God's life there is, or in God's favor there is life? Abundance. More than enough. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers. And I will keep my covenant with you. You will be eating, watch this, you will be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out and make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you. I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. One more time, verse 3. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season. You're not ready for my title. My title will just preach all on its own. I want to preach to you today from the title, Get Ready for the Rain. Get ready for the rain. I thought y'all were fasting, spiritual people. I thought you'd say amen or something when I gave you that title. Get ready for the rain. Get ready for the rain. And I know as I say that, we're all, we're all sick of the rain. <laughs> we're, 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 we're like, no, I, I'm praying a different way preacher. I'm, I wasn't ready for all of this. It's been raining and, and trying to snow for days on end, and, and, and we're praying for the sweet, sp- the, you know, the sweet scent of spring to come, and we're popping vitamin D pills because, because we moved here from a little bit further south, and, and we weren't ready for all this. Come on, we're, we're interceding for all our brand new friends from California and different places. We, we know you weren't ready for January. We know. We know. January's dark and cold and scary. You, you moved here in the summer. We're, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. But I'm preaching about a different kind of rain today. I'm preaching about a spiritual rain. And I felt like God told me to tell you today. I want to I wanna prophesy over your life today that God is about to send the rain on your life and over your life and over your marriage and over your business and over your praying and over your coming and over your going. God is about to send the rain. But here's what God told me to get, tell them. They got to get ready for the rain. You got to get ready for the rain. Now, last week, if uh, you were with us or maybe you caught it online and, and welcome to everybody that's with us online I preached to you last week um, about how you don't want to find yourself surrounded but without a sword. Uh, that you don't want to be already in the middle of a war, a spiritual war, and then only at that point uh, find yourself trying to look for a weapon. Israel had let their blacksmiths all go missing, whether they were killed or captured. Uh, we don't really know, but the Philistines took them out. And uh, everyone that knew how to take what was in the rocks, the raw material of iron that was in the rocks and heat it up and uh, turn it into a sword and to sharpen it so that they would be ready for battle, um, all, everybody went missing that knew how to blacksmith. And of course, the lesson there was that you've got to be a spiritual blacksmith so that you can take the the raw material of what God has given you in promises, and you know how to heat them up in prayer. As a blacksmith, you know how to turn what God has said to you into a sword that's sharp and ready for battle in your life. You got to be a blacksmith. Were you all there for that one? You got some of that? All right, now today, I actually want to continue in a somewhat similar kind of similar theme. This is about the closest I'm going to get to a series lately. I just, I don't like to do it anymore. I like to just, I like to just preach what's hot in my spirit every week. But, but last week I told you, you need to get ready for the battle. And now this week I want to preach the flip side of this. I want to preach to you this week and tell you that you need to get ready, not just for the battle, but you need to get ready now for the blessing. Yeah. Okay. There you go. There we go. There we go. 
Because I heard the Lord say, and, and you can take it if you want, or you, you can just leave it right here in church, but I, but I heard God say, tell them I'm about to bless them. The rain is coming in your life this year, this year, 2023. The, the, the rain is coming in your life. The, the blessing of God, the, the marked hand of God. I'm not just talking about, well, okay, that was, I'm talking about people will notice and people will take note. God is doing something new in your life and it will be one way and suddenly now it will be a different way that God is going to send a shift in your life that the blessing of God, the rain of God is about to come on your life. But in order to be blessed by the rain, watch me, you've got to be ready for the rain. I'm going to do my best to preach it, but the rain that was a physical rain for the Israelites caused their crops to flourish. For you might be the rain of a brand new opportunity or an open door or uh, all, for all you singles at the cause today, the right one coming along. It might be expanding, it might be expanding ministry, it might be healing, it, it might be the breakthrough, the freedom, the, the, the touch of God that you've needed, the reign of God. But here's the question, are you ready for the reign? Are you ready for the reign? Now I'm going to get back to that question in just a moment, but, but let's kind of get a panoramic of what was going on with the Israelites at this stage in their history. And let's work on the text just a little bit. Um, it, it says they've come out of bondage, of course, out of centuries of, of slavery. They've come out of Egypt and they've seen the hand of God hold up the sea and make walls out of the water. And they walked across on dry ground and they've, they've now come out into the desert. And through Moses, watch me, God is working to take them through a process of detox. It's like a, it's like a detox in the desert, which would also be another good title for another sermon for another time. It's like a detox in the desert because you can be out of Egypt, but come on somebody, that doesn't necessarily mean that Egypt is out of you. You can be out of a bad relationship. You can, you can dump them. You can be done with them, ditch them, praise God, amen. You can be out of a bad relationship, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the bad relationship is out of you. Now, all of a sudden, you're with the new one, but you're treating the new one like you used to interact with the old one, and now the new one is paying for the sins of the old one because you're out of the relationship, but it turns out the relationship wasn't out of you. Somebody say amen for the person next to you that might have gotten caught up in that at some point in their life. Part of being enslaved for so long was that Israel, God's chosen people, had no lo doubt lost some of their sense of identity as God's people. And, and you can be in something for so long that it can for a moment make you forget what's in you. Come on, let's go back to the relationship for a minute. You can be in a negative, poisonous, toxic relationship for so long. You can be in it for so long that for a moment you can forget what's in you. But I feel somebody getting a detox like you're out in a spiritual desert, but you're in the middle of a detox. And what did God say? You've been hanging your head in shame, but you're about to lift it up and look and see your help. For I am the Lord, your God. You got out of it but now in this season it's going to get out of you so so now so now through Moses God is helping them detox and and it's a good question to ask as we run into 2023 because God's got a whole lot for you but the question is I might be out of it but is it out of me because because I don't know about you but I don't want to be set free and blessed but still behaving like I'm stuck and in bondage, where I no longer have the bondage, but, but I still have some of the behaviors that I learned about while I was in the bondage. Because you can be in a new place, but if you bring the same old patterns, how many know that the new place gets to look in a whole lot like the old place? Self-imposed limitations and, and, and self-given labels. I think sometimes... The most difficult chains to get out of are the chains that we put on ourselves. 
God set them free of the chains that the Egyptians had put on them. But now God was going to set them free of the chains they were putting on themselves. And so God was reminding them in this time of who they were, of whose they were, and was restoring a sense of national identity, religious identity, and relational identity with Yahweh God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that has called you by your name. You are not what you've been through. You are defined by where I'm taking you and who's in you. You are mine. God kept repeating, I will be your God. I will walk among you. Can I remind you today, believer, that you are not the product of your past. You are the product of God's presence at work in your life. And God is taking you through a detox today. So now y'all are getting me to preach it even harder than I did last time. So let's, let's get into the text a little bit because God makes something so clear. And God makes this clear all through the Bible over and over and over and over again. It's expressed in verse 1. Don't make idols or set up an image. Hey, you know, um, call me crazy. Maybe this is just... Maybe this is just me, but I don't know that I would ever want to have a God that I have to set up myself. I'm, I'm so thankful that I don't have a God that I have to prop up. But that I have a God that when I'm about to fall, comes and props me back up. Come on, I'm thankful today that I don't have a God that I created. I've got a God that created me. That says, I knew you before you were born. Even in your mother's womb, you've been fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together. You didn't make me. I made you. God says, do not place a carved stone in your land. Do not bow before it. And what God is revealing here, and, and this you got to catch because, because I know we're not, we're not setting up carved idols, but yet we're setting up other idols sometimes, maybe without even noticing it, maybe without even noticing it. And what God is saying here is, is I, I will not compete. I won't compete for your heart, for your devotion, for your attention. If you want to give your attention to a deaf, dumb idol made of stone, then I'll let you. But it's, but it's never going to be the idol and me. It's always going to be the idol or me. It can't be the idol and me. I will not compete. What did Jesus say? Echoes it again in the new covenant. I want your whole heart. That's what I require. Wholeness of heart. I want your whole heart. After all, God had set them free for the express purpose that they would come out into a new place and freely give God their praise. And God is still in the business of setting people free, breaking the chains off your wrists, off your hands, so that you can lift up those hands and thank the God that set you free. Now, verse 3, it says, If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send rain in its season. You'll be threshing, planting, harvesting. You'll eat all the food you want. All the people fasting said, amen, you'll, you'll eat all the food you want and live in safety. But of course, we need to pay attention to the operative part of this phrase, which, which is if, if, if. God says, if you follow my decrees, if, if you follow my commands, if you seek my ways, if you heed the instruction of the Lord, if you incline your heart towards me, then if you... If you follow my commands, then the rain will come. Then the blessing will shower down. So what does that mean for me, for you, for the person sitting next to you, for the one all the way down the road that looks a little sleepy already, for everybody in this place? Uh, and, and let me just warn you, I'm going to preach it a little bit hard, but I promise you I'm going to encourage you before you go today. Here's what that means. Here's what that if means. We have no right to expect God to work when we've disregarded God's ways. And I'm not preaching about living in perfection, but I am preaching about living in pursuit. That God, I'm pursuing your ways. Obedience has never, ever, ever, ever been about God getting something from you. Obedience has always been in the heart of God about God getting a blessing to you. 
Obedience is what positions me to receive of the fullness of God's promises over me. Okay, let, 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 me, let me put it like this. Obedience is taking advantage of all that God offers. And I don't know about you, but when I signed up for this and I said yes to God, I didn't come in with a prayer like, God, well, I guess I want like maybe 30% of what you got for me. I came in like, God, I want 103% of every promise. And I want to let you know today that obedience is God's design where you can step into obedience and therefore doing so, take advantage of everything that God has offered for your life. The, the, the issue has been that we have treated the promises of God as a guarantee. And, and I'm not talking about the promises of God that have to do with God's dealings with humanity overall and the sovereign saving purposes of God. I'm talking about those rhema promises over your life. I'm talking about those highlighted verses that God gave you. I'm talking about that dream that God put in your heart, put in your spirit, even at an early age. The, the, the problem at times has been that we treated them like a guarantee. When actually they're an invitation, every promise is an invitation to experience God's power. If, if, that's the operative part, if. Every once in a while, I'll, uh, you know, I'll sit down for coffee with somebody and um, they'll be telling me about their life. And, you know, I, I love that. I love that part of what I get to do. And I love to hear about what's going on with somebody. Uh, but, you know, I've had sit downs with people where, it was like, you know, I'm really going through it in my marriage. You know, for example, I'm really going through it in my marriage, and I might be able to speak into that a little bit, and then inevitably, you know, I'm going to say something like, well, hey, you know, we have a really great um, opportunity for you. Uh, we've got a marriage connected. Were you able to check that out? And they're like, mm, nah, I was kind of straight. I'm like, what's that? You were busy? Too busy fighting with your spouse? <laughs> you know? And, and then it's like, well, I just, I just, I need to hear from God. I need, I need direction. I don't know what to do next. And, and I don't really know how to hear from God. And, 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 I, and I might say something like, well, from my experience, if, if you don't know how to hear from God, one really great move you can make is get an environment where people do know how to hear from God. And, and hey, by the way, um, I might have mentioned this a few times, but did you know that we have prayer every single Wednesday from 6 to 7? Yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to buy a ticket or nothing. You can just, you can just come right in. And it's like, well, no. I just really need right now in my life, I just need courage for what I'm up against. And, and at this point now, I'm like, well, did, did, you, did you happen to catch the, the last sermon that I preached just, just this past week? I actually preached on the exact subject of courage in God. Did you catch that one? No, I didn't. <laughs> and you know what I have never done? is gotten my sermon notes back out and then re-preached them in the coffee shop. That'd just be awkward. <laughs> and look, I'm not mad at anybody, okay? I'm not saying, I'm, I'm mad at a few people. <laughs> but <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that we can't blame God for missing promises, watch me, when we haven't participated. <laughs> Obedience is your opportunity. Ah! <laughs> Listen to this, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. This is love for God. This is love for God. Well, what's love for God? Did I kind of do this one, once in a while? This is love for God. Wait, what does that mean? Did, did I have like uh, the, the fish bumper sticker on my car? Does that mean that, that, I, that I attend everything the church does? It says, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And then watch this. Here's the next part. And his commands are not burdensome. I'm telling you, if you catch this, it will ripple through your life 
and everything will be different in three months from now. Watch this. The commandments of God aren't a burden. It'll change everything if you see it. The command of God, the ways of God, the instruction of God, the commands of God, every time it says, thus says the Lord, it's never a burden. It's always an opportunity for your next blessing. That's who our God is. Not another burden, another opportunity to experience God's blessing. Not just to know about it, not just to clap for somebody else's blessing, but every command. It's not a burden, it's another opportunity for blessing. Like, like, like let's take worship, for example. You know, God says, clap your hands. You know, we didn't just come up with this stuff. It wasn't a bunch of, like, charismatic Christians that got together one day and they're like, you know, we should... Why don't we all just clap our hands? That's what God said to do. That was the command of God. If you want to worship me, it's not about how you feel. It's about your faith. And here's what I want out of worship. I want you to clap your hands. That's why we do it. And God says, and lift your voice and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Anytime somebody's got a problem with a loud preacher, you bring them right to that verse and say, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Oh, I'm a kind of an introvert, though. I'm, a, I'm an introvert. Like, okay, I guess, God, if I, I guess, God, if I, if I got to. I know breakthrough is coming. Can we be done now? Can I sit down and go back to my journaling now? Can I tell you something? There's no blessing in making worship a burden. Did, did you know you can do something but not really do it? Isn't that true? You can be someplace but not really be someplace. But if I shift from God, your command is a burden to God, your command is an opportunity for blessing, you can't tell me otherwise. Because I've shown up to God's house and I've come together with God's people way too many times when I was busted and I was bruised and I was discouraged, but I made the simple choice to lift up my voice and to rejoice. And it wasn't a burden. It was the opportunity for a blessing. And then all of a sudden, once again, as God has done so many times before, the strength of the Lord hits my spiritual veins once again, and I'm built up down in my most inner self and this isn't a burden all along worship and praise and shouting unto God was an opportunity for me to be blessed how, how about church did you know God commands us to be in church that's that's in the Bible don't neglect coming together as in some are the habit of doing it's it's but 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 if but if you think of church as an obligation as a burden, you might as well stay in your bedroom. You could be sleeping right now. Because, yeah, you could, you could be here and not really be here. That's, that's why this principle goes to work. And you got to understand this principle as a preacher, else you will be confused. Because out of a bunch of people who will be in church, one person will just be knocked out by the power of God. They will be changed forever. And another person is snoring. And you don't know why. Because one person made it a burden. One person knew this is an opportunity for a blessing. I feel the anointing of God on this one. Y'all in here with me? Hey, come on, somebody say amen. This ain't no burden. This is an opportunity for me to be blessed. So, so God, this year, this is what I believe for your life. God's going to release the rain. But here's the question we're asking with this message. Are you ready? Are you ready? God says, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops, and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and the grape harvest will continue until planting, and you eat all the food you want and live safely in your land. So our attention tends to be drawn to the rain. We, we, like, these, we like these verses about the rain. If you've been in the church for a minute, you like the rain. You know to like the rain. You're like, God, make it rain. 
I love the rain. We sing songs about the rain. We worship God. Rain down your spirit. Rain in my life. Rain everywhere. God, rain, rain, rain. God, make it rain. We love the rain. Send the opportunity. Give me the breakthrough, God. Make a way, way maker, God, where there is no way. God, do it in my life. But what it actually says is I will send the rain in its season, in the right time, in the right way, through the right person, the right circumstance, in the right season. I will send the rain in its season. Let me show you what God showed me. Can I take you a little bit deeper into this text? I know this is going to kind of go up against some of our uh, charismatic theology. For those of us, like the, the type of person that's in church today, and all I have to say is shout, and then you're like, and the walls will come down. Like for those types of people in the church today, this is going to mess with your theology just a little bit, that you don't actually want continual rain. You need some dry seasons. I'm going to show you why. Because when it's dry, you have the opportunity to plant. Now, here's my sermon. Here's my sermon. Because if you don't get to work when it's dry, if you don't prepare when it's dry, if you don't do any planting, then when God sends the rain, all you'll have is puddles. Hey. So I got a question. Are you ready for the rain? Do you have some, have you gotten something in the ground? Do you have your hands dirty? Are you sowing a different kind of seed? Are you praying a different kind of prayer? Are you making some moves that you've never made before because you're trusting God for a different kind of miracle? Have you been planting? Because if you haven't been planting, even when God sends the rain, all you'll have is some puddles. But if you've been planting, now God sends the rain, and what you've been planting all of a sudden is going to spring up and produce. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Because here's what we're asking. What, what good is all the water if we haven't done any of the work? Back a few years ago, um, more than a few years ago, actually, back when I was 21 years old, so 19 years ago, yeah, that's right, I'm 40. A few years ago, um, God did a great miracle in my life. I, I had the privilege of growing up in God's house, and I had a, had a mom that would drag me to church, whether I wanted to come or not. When I was little, I'd be just stuck down. We had the cheap plastic chairs. You know, I'd be stuck down under one of the chairs, and then even through my teenage years, she would make sure. I was up, up to this, that, and the other, but she would say, you better, you better find your way to church by the time the weekend's done. And so all my life, I knew, I knew God loved me and had a great plan for me. But the catch was like, I had a plan of my own. You see what I'm saying? And when I was 21, it was like, it was like the hand of God burst out of the atmosphere and got all over my life. I wasn't, I wasn't sitting in church. I wasn't in any kind of environment where I should have been otherwise inspired to, to give my life over to the Lord. But it was like out of nowhere, God just said, I've called you. I want you for myself. Will you give me your whole life? And I had gone down to spend one short year of study at WSU. Don't, don't worry, your, your pastor later, I circled back later, and, and yeah, I studied theology. But, but at the time, I was at WSU for one short year, and there, right there in, in my dorm room, it was like God put a hand on me, and I said, God, I'm going to give you my whole life. I'm all yours. God, if I'm going to do this, it's, a, it's not a yes for a week or a month. It's a yes for life. I'm giving you my yes. And I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I went and I dug out the Bible that my mom had made sure that I packed when I left for WSU. And I, I dug out this Bible, and I got it. And I don't know that I'd ever really read the Bible. I knew some of the verses, but as I was reading the Scripture, all of a sudden they were alive. And it was like God was speaking to me, and everything was changing. And my heart was just melting in God's presence. And, and it wasn't long. I, I, I was telling God, I said, God, I want to preach. You ever just know something? Like nobody has to tell you, you just know it. I was telling God, God, 
you've called me to preach your gospel. I'm going to preach. And, and I, was, I was sharing Jesus with everybody I could find. I mean, you know, the, like, the, like the person, the, the poor girl, you know, working at the fast food, it was like she had to give her life to Jesus so she could get the rest of the line and I would get out of the way. Like, that's how I was. I was so in love with Jesus, and I'm more in love with Jesus today, 19 years later. But I just knew, I just, God, I was praying, God, give me an opportunity to preach. You call me as a preacher, give me an opportunity to preach. And back then, I don't know if YouTube existed, but if it did, I didn't have YouTube. All I had uh, was a, ch- a TV channel called TPN. Some of you know what TPN was, maybe you don't, but I had TPN, and so I'd, I'd be watching these preachers that, you know, even to this day, a lot of them, they're, they're my faith heroes. I was watching people like Jensen Franklin and Rod Parsley and T.D. Jakes, and I'd be watching these preachers. I was kind of like, okay, Lord, I'm waiting for my call. I figure T.D. TD's going to call me up one of these days. He's probably going to have to find my mom's number because I don't really have a number. I didn't have a cell phone back then. Probably call my mom and leave a message. Hey, I heard about what God's doing in Aaron's life. I want Aaron to come and preach at the Potter's House in Dallas, Texas. I thought I was, waiting, I was waiting for my come up. I was waiting for my call up. And then one day I felt like God asked me a question. I was praying, God, send me to preach. God, make me a preacher. And then I felt like God asked me a question. If I gave you a microphone, what would you say? I said, well, God, I, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> I, hadn't really, I hadn't really considered that part. I, really, I don't know about all that. Look, looking back now, it's like God was saying, I'm about to send the rain, but I need you to be ready. So I stopped praying for a chance to preach, and I switched gears, and I went into preparing for a chance to preach. So what I would do, back then we didn't have MacBooks, so I, I, would, get a, I would get a blank notebook and, and it's funny, once my wife and I got together and we got married, we talked about it. She used to do the same stuff. And, and I, would get, I would get a blank notebook and I would fill it up with notes of sermons that nobody would ever hear. I'm preparing. I'm preparing for a chance to preach. And you know what I did? This is kind of embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you because I love you. And I thought maybe administer to somebody. It's embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I went and I got a copy of the, of the key to the door of the church that I was part of at the time. And I would wait until I knew nobody was going to be around. And I would open up the deadbolt and I would go in. And they had this pulpit that looked like it was right from the set of TBN. It was this big, this big kind of gaudy black, uh, glass pulpit and I would set those handwritten notes on that pulpit and then I would preach like the house was packed full of God's people and I'd be stomping around saying God's gonna do it in your life God hasn't made you the tail but has made you the head and I'd be going off and every once in a while I hear a noise about like sit down What I'm trying to say is that you got to get some seed in the ground. The rain is up to God, but getting ready is up to you. Are you ready for the rain? Are you ready for the rain? You, you, You don't mind preaching to empty chairs if you know God's about to make it rain and someday you're going to preach to full chairs. The rain is up to God, but getting ready is up to you. Let's... Let's break it way down. Oh, God, bless my finances. Give me increase. God, you see my business. Give to me so I can give to you. I want to build your church. And that's a good prayer to pray. But you got to be careful that you're not praying for rain that you're actually not ready for. If you can't tithe off a little, can I tell you that it's going to be exponentially more difficult to tithe off your lot? So quiet in church. Get ready for the rain. rain. See, every once in a while, it's okay to have a dry season. It's actually a sign that God is giving you the opportunity to set yourself up for the next level of what God would have for you. God is saying, I'm allowing it to be dry for now because you've got some seed in your hand, because you've got some preparation to do, because I want to see you get a little dirty. I want to see you get down in it. I want to see you get ready for the rain. I'm preaching 
better than you're talking back, just so you know, <laughs> by my gauge. So it's actually sometimes to our advantage that God waits to send the rain because it gives you more time to get ready for that rain. I don't, I don't want to miss it because I got nothing in the ground. So we're talking about getting ready for the rain. That's the picture of what to do before God would bless you. But then watch this. We also got to talk about after the rain, when God has blessed you. Because it says they were threshing, they were harvesting, they continued planting, they were threshing, they were harvesting, they were working, they were planting, they were harvesting, they were threshing. So here's what the passage says without saying. More rain means more work. That's what we sometimes miss. I, I heard one preacher one time use this phrase. I don't know if it was in this context, but I'm going to use it for, for this context. They, they said, there's a backside to every blessing. Because, you know, we, we pray about the harvest. Oh, God, send the harvest. And we get, you know, we get real Pentecostal. We're like, from the highways and the byways, God, send the harvest. And, and the harvest might be... Uh, what God would do in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your business, in your ministry. We pray God send the harvest. But can I tell you something today? The harvesting part is actually the hardest part. I, I realized that as I was studying. I was studying for you this week. I realized that. It's, it's really not that hard to sit around and wait for the harvest. Oh, God, do it in my life. Oh, God, give me increase. God, I want more. Oh, God, bless me. Well, that's not that hard. But when God actually does it, the harvesting part is the hardest part. Now you got to get up early, and now you're threshing, and now you're collecting, and now you're going to bed late, and now you're sweating. Now you got to call in extra help. Now you got to adjust your whole life. The harvesting part is actually the hardest part. So what I'm trying to preach right to somebody's spirit today, because this is going to set you up for what God has for you in 2023, are you prepared to receive what you've been praying for? Are you prepared for the answer of your prayer because there's a there's a backside to every blessing we, we can see the front side of somebody else's blessing and it's like whoo look at all those crops that's the front side Let, okay let's modernize it we, we we can see the instagram reel of somebody else's blessing look look what god is doing in their life look what god is doing oh it's a, and and it's easy to say god i want to be blessed like they're blessed but there's a backside to every blessing like, like let's, let's put out some examples so it's not just these sort of high concepts and, well, the preacher, I got goosebumps, but I don't really know what was going on. Let, let me help you take this into your Wednesday. There's a backside to every blessing. It's a blessing to get married, isn't it? Come on, everybody that's married is like, yeah, woo. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. I've been married 16, going on 17 years. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. But there's a backside to every blessing. Don't look at your spouse now. <laughs> Come on, when, when you're single and you're just, you're just doing whatever you want to do, it's just all about you. But the backside of that blessing is now it's not just about you, it's about them. There's a, there's a backside of, hey, more pay at work? Come on, that's a blessing. They give you a promotion at work? That's a blessing. God, I have, I've got more to sow in. God, I can take care of my family. I'm putting some away. That's a blessing. But there's a backside to every blessing. You used to just have to worry about getting your own butt to work on time. Now you're the, now you're the manager. you got to worry about getting all the butts to work on time. That's a lot of butts. There's a backside to every blessing. It, it, it used to be you and everybody gossiping about the boss around the water cooler. But now everybody is gossiping about the boss around the water cooler and you're the boss. <laughs> Come on. There's a backside to every blessing. So, so are you prepared for the hard work of what you're praying for? Because this is going to be your year. 2023, God's going to cause it to rain in your life. But the harvesting part is also the hardest part. And God would meet you with strength. And God would meet you with more 
than enough. The rain is coming. God is going to favor you. God's going to put a hand on your life. I feel the spirit of God on this. If you, if you don't want it, you don't have to receive it. But if you want this for your life, I want you to get this today. God is going to do something fresh and new and vibrant and full of life. God is going to cause the rain to pour out in 2023. And I wonder, is anybody going to be ready for the rain? Come on. We're a people, God, that are ready for the rain. All right, you want me to be done or you want me to give you the last bit? You do? You want it? Can I have three minutes? All right. There's an exchange rate with preachers and, and congregations. It's 10 to 1 exchange rate. That means I have 30 minutes now because you gave me three. <laughs> I mean, after all, you drove all the way out here on this cold January. Might as well get all God has for you. Okay, let's just, let's just do a little more work on this. Verses 9 through 13, it's just so good. I just want to read this over you. I'm going to show you what God showed me. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers. And I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out and make room for the new. You will, you will still be eating last year's harvest when you have to move it out and make room for the new. We've been preaching about live ready for the rain and the rain's going to come and then you got to be the one that gets up and does the hard work of the harvesting. But now I want to talk about the result. Here's the result. God says, you'll have so much that you'll still be eating off the old blessing at the arrival of the new blessing. This is, now I want to preach the miracle of living in momentum. The miracle of momentum. What, after all, would stop us at any point in our life from getting some good seed in the ground? Sometimes, it's that we're so exhausted. We're so worn out. We're saying to ourselves, God, I don't know if I can get up and do it again. I don't even know if I can show up again. I don't know if I can sing another song. I don't know if I can pray that way again. I don't know if I can get my hopes up because my hopes have been let down. I don't know if I can get back up there and do that again. And then God, it's like God puts a wrench into the negative cycle you've been in because when you've been weakened, you can't even get up and plant. And so even when the rain comes you can't receive from the rain because you didn't have anything good in the ground and God throws throws a stop to the cycle because for some of us we've been in a cycle where it's like it, it goes from bad to worse and from bleak to bleaker and it's like we're just living in dryness living in a desert but God says if you can get up this time this time right now this time and you can get something good in the ground here's what I'm gonna do no longer will you be living in puddles. If you can just, if you can get something good in the ground this year, if you can get something good in the ground, maybe that just means, God, no matter, come hell or high water, I'm going to get to your house every Sunday. God, I might go back to all my, all my crap through the week, but just right now, God, all I can give you, I'm going to get to your house. I'm going to get something good in the ground. If it's in your marriage and, and all you can say is, God, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to go ahead. We're going to buy that book that that one preacher told us about. We're going to buy that book. We're going to read it together. God, I'm just going to get some good seed in the ground. And God says, if you'll stop the cycle, if you'll, in the middle of your dryness, get some seed in the ground, here's what your God will do. You will still be eating of the last blessing when here comes the next blessing. I wanna, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to make you feel it down in your spirit like I've been feeling it all week. Here's what happens. You go from not enough to more than enough. There's no more gaps. 
there's no more gaps. It's not I'm, I'm going from brokenness to a little bit of blessing back to brokenness. It's I'm going from blessed to I'm even more blessed to I'm even more blessed. The Bible talks about going from strength to strength and from glory to glory to glory. I no longer, it's not that I don't have enough. I've got more than enough. And here's what happens when you have more than you need. Because, because God says, You'll have to move it out to make room for the new. The old, you'll, the old blessing, what I did last season, now in the new season, you'll have to move it out. Here's what happens. When you have more than you need, what's in your hand becomes a seed. So now it's, it's the miracle of momentum. I didn't eat all my seed. I didn't use it all up, and God, oh God, bless me again. I've got more than enough, so I'm putting something good back in the ground for next season and see are y'all with me I could keep preaching it but I know I used up my time and now season after season after season the last blessing is running up against this blessing and the next blessing is coming when I haven't even used up the last blessing come on is anybody ready for God to take you from strength to strength and from glory to glory come on somebody stand to your feet and shout I'm ready for the rain come on I'm ready for the rain I'm ready for the rain. I'm ready for the rain. Come on, stretch out your hands all over the room. <laughs>